What is the meaning of life? So many people have never stopped to consider this important question. They look back years later to wonder why their relationships have fallen apart and why they feel so empty, even though they may have achieved what they set out to accomplish. Many goals reveal their emptiness only after years have been wasted in their pursuit. The author of the biblical book Ecclesiastes describes this feeling when he says, Meaningless, meaningless, utterly meaningless, everything is meaningless. Ecclesiastes 1-2 King Solomon, the writer of Ecclesiastes, had wealth beyond measure, wisdom beyond any man of his time or ours, hundreds of women, palaces and gardens that were the envy of kingdoms, the best food and wine, and every form of entertainment available. He summed up life under the sun, life lived as though all there is to life is what we can see with our eyes and experience with our senses, is meaningless. Why is there such a void? Because God created us for something beyond what we can experience in the here and now. Solomon said of God, he has also set eternity in the hearts of men. Ecclesiastes 3.11 In our hearts, we are aware that the here and now is not all there is. In Genesis, the first book of the Bible, we find that God created man in his image. Genesis 1.26 This means that we are more like God than we are like anything else, any other life form. We also find that before mankind fell into sin and the curse of sin came upon the earth, the following things were true. 1. God made man a social creature. Genesis 2.18-25 2. God gave man work. Genesis 2.15 3. God had fellowship with man. Genesis 3.8 and 4. God gave man dominion over the earth. Genesis 1.26 What is the significance of these things? God intended for each of these to add to our fulfillment in life. But all of these, especially man's fellowship with God, were adversely affected by man's fall into sin and the resulting curse upon the earth. Genesis 3 in Revelation, the last book of the Bible, God reveals that he will destroy the present earth and heavens and usher in the eternal state by creating a new heaven and a new earth. At that time, he will restore full fellowship with redeemed mankind, while the unredeemed will have been judged unworthy and cast into the lake of fire. Revelation 20, 11-15 The curse of sin will be done away with. There will be no more sin, sorrow, sickness, death, or pain. Revelation 21, 4 God will dwell with them, and they shall be his sons. Revelation 21.7 Thus we come full circle. God created us to have fellowship with him. Man sinned, breaking that fellowship. God restores that fellowship fully in the eternal state. To go through life achieving everything, only to die separated from God for eternity would be worse than futile. But God has made a way not only to make eternal bliss possible, Luke 23.43, but also life on earth satisfying and meaningful. How is this eternal bliss and heaven on earth obtained? Real meaning in life, both now and in eternity, is found in the restoration of the relationship with God that was lost with Adam and Eve's fall into sin. That relationship with God is only possible through His Son, Jesus Christ. Acts 4.12, John 1.12 and 14.6 Eternal life is gained when we repent of our sin no longer wanting to continue in it, and Christ changes us, making us new creations, and we rely on Jesus Christ as Savior. We can continue to seek to guide our own lives, which results in emptiness, or we can choose to pursue God and His will for our lives with a whole heart, which will result in living life to the full, having the desires of our hearts met, and finding contentment and satisfaction. This is so because our Creator loves us and desires the best for us, not necessarily the easiest life, but the most fulfilling. Got questions? The Bible has answers. Is the Bible truly God's Word? The question we must ask ourselves is how we can know that the Bible is the Word of God and not just a good book. What is unique about the Bible that sets it apart from all other religious books ever written? Is there any evidence that the Bible is truly God's Word? These types of questions must be seriously examined if we are to determine the validity of the Bible's claim to be the very Word of God, divinely inspired, and totally sufficient for all matters of faith and practice. There are both internal and external evidence that the Bible is truly God's Word. The internal evidences are those things within the Bible that testify of its divine origin. One of the first internal evidences that the Bible is truly God's Word is seen in its unity. Even though it is really 66 individual books written on three continents in three different languages over a period of approximately 1,500 years by more than 40 authors who came from many walks of life, 
the Bible remains one unified book from beginning to end without contradiction. This unity is unique from all other books and is evidence of the divine origin of the words which God moved men to record. Another internal evidence are the prophecies contained within the Bible. The Bible contains hundreds of detailed prophecies relating to the future of individual nations including Israel, certain cities, and mankind. Other prophecies concern the coming of the one who would be the Messiah, the savior of all who would believe in him. Unlike the prophecies found in other religious books, biblical prophecies are extremely detailed. There are over 300 prophecies concerning Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. Not only was it foretold where he would be born and his lineage, but also how he would die and that he would rise again. There is simply no other logical way to explain the fulfilled prophecies in the Bible other than by divine origin. There is no other religious book with the extent or type of predictive prophecy that the Bible contains. A third internal evidence is the Bible's unique authority and power. While this evidence is more subjective than the first two, it is no less a powerful testimony of the divine origin of the Bible. The Bible's authority is unlike any other book ever written. This authority and power are best seen in the way countless lives have been transformed by the supernatural power of God's word. Drug addicts have been cured by it, homosexuals set free by it, derelicts and deadbeats transformed by it, hardened criminals reformed by it, sinners rebuked by it, and hate turned to love by it. There are also external evidences that indicate the Bible is truly the word of God. One is the historicity of the Bible. Because the Bible details historical events, its truthfulness and accuracy are subject to verification like any other historical document. Through both archaeological evidences and other writings, the historical accounts of the Bible have been proven time and time again to be accurate and true. In fact, all the archaeological and manuscript evidence supporting the Bible makes it the best documented book from the ancient world. Another external evidence that the Bible is truly God's word is the indestructibility of the Bible. Because of its importance and its claim to be the very word of God, the Bible has suffered more vicious attacks and attempts to destroy it than any other book in history. From early Roman emperors like Diocletian, through communist dictators, to modern day atheists and agnostics, the Bible has withstood and outlasted all of its attackers and is still today the most widely published book in the world. The Bible continues to be attacked by pseudoscience, psychology, and political movements yet it remains just as true and relevant today as it was when it was first written. It is a book that has transformed countless lives and cultures throughout the last 2,000 years. It should not surprise us that no matter how the Bible is attacked, it always comes out unchanged and unscathed. After all, Jesus said, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Mark 13, 31. After looking at the evidence, one can say without a doubt that yes, the Bible is truly God's word. What does it mean that Jesus saves? Jesus saves is a popular slogan on bumper stickers, signs at athletic events, and even banners being pulled across the sky by small airplanes. Sadly, few who see this phrase, Jesus saves, truly and fully understand what it means. There is a tremendous amount of power and truth packed into those two words. Jesus saves, but who is Jesus? Most people understand that Jesus was a man who lived in Israel approximately 2,000 years ago. Virtually every religion in the world views Jesus as a good teacher and or a prophet. And while those things are most definitely true of Jesus, they do not capture who Jesus truly is, nor do they explain how or why Jesus saves. Jesus is God in human form, John 1, 1 and 14. Jesus is God, come to earth, as a true human being, 1 John 4, 2. God became a human being in the person of Jesus in order to save us. That brings up the next question. Why do we need to be saved? The Bible declares that every human being who has ever lived has sinned, Ecclesiastes 7.20 and Romans 3.23. To sin is to do something, whether in thought, word, or deed, that contradicts God's perfect and holy character. Because of our sin, we all deserve judgment from God, John 3.18 and 36. God is perfectly just, so he cannot allow sin and evil to go unpunished. Since God is infinite and eternal, and since all sin is ultimately against God, Psalm 51.4, only an infinite and eternal punishment is sufficient. Eternal death is the only just punishment for sin. That is why we need to be saved. So, how does Jesus save? Because we have sinned against an infinite God, either a finite person, us, 
must pay for our sins for an infinite amount of time, or an infinite person, Jesus, must pay for our sins one time. There is no other option. Jesus saves us by dying in our place. In the person of Jesus Christ, God sacrificed himself on our behalf, paying the infinite and eternal penalty only he could pay. 2 Corinthians 5.21 and 1 John 2.2 Jesus took the punishment that we deserve in order to save us from a horrible eternal destiny, the just consequence of our sin. Because of his great love for us, Jesus laid down his life, John 15.13, paying the penalty that we had earned but could not pay. Jesus was then resurrected, demonstrating that his death was indeed sufficient to pay the penalty for our sins. 1 Corinthians 15 So who did Jesus save? Jesus saves all who will receive his gift of salvation. Jesus saves all those who fully trust in his sacrifice alone as the payment for their sin. John 3.16 and Acts 16.31 While Jesus' sacrifice was perfectly sufficient to pay for the sins of all humanity, Jesus only saves those who personally receive his most precious of gifts. John 1.12 If you now understand what it means that Jesus saves, and you want to trust him as your personal savior, make sure you understand and believe the following. And as an act of faith, communicate the following to God. God, I know that I am a sinner, and I know that because of my sin, I deserve to be eternally separated from you. Even though I do not deserve it, Thank you for loving me and providing the sacrifice for my sins through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. I believe that Jesus died for my sins and I trust him alone to save me. From this point forward, help me to live a life for you instead of for sin. Help me to live the rest of my life in gratitude for the wonderful salvation you have provided. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me.